Hello and welcome to another TLDR Global video. A couple of weeks ago, we put out a video about global debt, where we explained how the world owed a huge $277 trillion, a lot of that owed to China. In response to that video, some of you have accused China of lending money to desperate countries who obviously won't be able to pay them back. And when they can't, they use those loans as leverage to force these poor countries into giving up strategic interests, like ports or infrastructure. So in this video, we'll be taking a look at whether it's really fair, and if China is truly the world's biggest loan shark. This is a new channel from us, so if you want to support our independent reporting in a world where journalism's dictated by clicks and algorithms rather than important stories, then consider backing us on Patreon. In return, you'll get a whole bunch of perks, including exclusive access to live events, early access to videos, and thanks in videos. Also, this month only, every $10 plus Patreon backer gets one of these exclusive golden pin badges. These will never be for sale, so make sure you sign up this month to get your exclusive badge. Thanks for your support. So, as we mentioned in the intro, some commenters have accused China of basically being an international loan shark, and offering unsustainable loans to developing countries in order to extract some sort of non-financial strategic advantage. This is what's known as debt trap diplomacy, a term coined by Indian analyst Brahma Chalani in 2017. But scepticism about China's lending motives predates the term. In 2011, when she was Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton warned Africans of China's new colonialism. Then, in 2014, at the US-Africa summit, Obama advised African leaders to make sure that Chinese firms were hiring African workers. Even more recently, in 2018, a bipartisan group of 16 senators warned of the danger of China's debt trap diplomacy, and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that China shows up with bribes to senior leaders in countries in exchange for infrastructure projects. Basically, it's taken for granted, at least in US circles, that this is something that China does. So, in this video, we're going to take a look at the arguments for and against. We're not going to take a side on this, because we're a neutral channel, we're just going to present the respective arguments. People that argue that China does in fact engage in debt trap diplomacy cite three main things. Firstly, China lends out a lot of money to developing countries. Secondly, China is notably opaque about their lending practices. And thirdly, at least according to proponents of the argument, China has history in debt trap diplomacy. Let's start with the first point. China does indeed lend a lot of money to developing countries, with this only increasing in recent years. A Harvard Business Review study found that in total, China's loaned about $1.5 trillion in direct loans and trade credits to more than 150 countries around the globe. This makes China the world's biggest lender, larger than the World Bank, the IMF, or all of the OECD creditor governments combined. The People's Bank of China has also agreed to swap deals with 40 central banks, providing these countries with the right to exchange more than 500 billion US dollars of their own currencies for the Chinese renminbi. On top of these 40 countries, 12 developing countries owe at least 20% of their annual GDP for China, and this lending is only expected to increase because China has planned a whole load more infrastructure projects as part of its Belt and Road Initiative, which is maybe a topic for another video. Proponents of the debt trap diplomacy thesis argue that China is deliberately lending unsustainable amounts of money to developing countries in order to extract geostrategic concessions from them later. The second point often made is that China is suspiciously opaque when it comes to lending practices. China has no centralised data on its lending, and that same Harvard Business Review study estimates that as much as 50% of Chinese loans to the developing world go unreported. So, proponents of the debt trap diplomacy thesis argue that this is essentially China hiding its dodgy loans from international scrutiny. The third piece of evidence here is that China has form in this area. There have been a couple of instances in the past where China has seemingly used its debt as leverage to secure geostrategic goals. The most well-known case is the Hambam Tota port in Sri Lanka, but there are other examples. 
Staying true with the TLDR brand, we're going to focus on three. Sri Lanka, Djibouti and Tajikistan. In 2017, a state-affiliated Chinese firm, CM Port, bought a 70% majority stake in the geostrategically important Hambam Tota port with a 99-year lease for $1.1 billion. This happened while Sri Lanka had an unsustainable debt-to-GDP ratio of 75% and already owed China about $8 billion. Anyway, you can see how it looks that when Sri Lanka couldn't pay back its loans, China said, that's alright, we'll just take that port from you. And Sri Lanka, well, they couldn't really say no. In Djibouti, China has provided nearly $1.4 billion worth of funding for major investment projects, equivalent to 75% of Djibouti's GDP, with future projects reportedly including at least two new airports, a new port, an oil terminal, and a toll road. It's hard to know a precise figure, but it's thought that Djibouti owes about 70% of all of its debt to China, the most by percentage of any country in the world. So, in 2015, when China opened its first overseas military facility in Djibouti, well, you can see how this looked. China loans a lot of money to the country and then says, we're going to put a military base here. And, well, Djibouti can't really say anything, can they? The third and final case we're going to look at is Tajikistan. Like Djibouti, Tajikistan's largest creditor is China. In 2017, Tajikistan owed $700 million to China's Exim Bank, which came to about 36% of the country's total external debt. So, in 2011, when Tajikistan ceded 1,000 square kilometers of disputed land to China, proponents of the debt trap diplomacy thesis suspected that China had used its debt as leverage in order to secure the concession. So, that's the debt trap diplomacy argument in a nutshell. However, there is an opposing argument. Again, we're going to split that argument into three points. Firstly, China doesn't actually lend money to countries in risk of debt distress. Secondly, China's lending practices can be explained by the fact that the infrastructure projects are actually good investments for the developing countries. And thirdly, those case studies aren't quite as nefarious as they seem to be. So, for the first point. While China does lend money to developing countries, and some of those countries are at risk of debt distress, it might be less than you think. A Jubilee Debt Campaign report found that China loaned money to 15 African countries in risk of debt distress, but that it hadn't loaned dangerous amounts of money to most of them. For these countries, the mean average owed to China was 15% of the government's external debt, and the median average was 8%. But in all three cases, China has engaged in some sort of debt relief with them. In fact, in 2020, China joined the G20's Coronavirus Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which paused debt service payments from all three countries. And this isn't even an anomaly. China has written off about $260 million worth of Zambian debt and about $200 million worth of Cameroonian debt since 2001. To back all this up, the Rhodium Group analysis of 40 cases of Chinese debt distress found that the most common outcomes were debt forgiveness and restructuring, and the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, which has a 1,000 case database on Chinese loans, concluded that, quote, So far in Africa, we've not seen any examples where we would say that China deliberately entangled another country in debt and used that debt to extract unfair or strategic advantages of some kind in Africa. The point is that debt trap diplomats don't normally pause or write off debts, and that's what China often does. The second argument is that China's lending pattern makes more sense in context. Infrastructure projects are actually good investments for developing countries, and currently China is the only major player with industrial expertise offering these big infrastructure loans as part of their Belt and Road Initiative. But they're not the only ones who are interested in doing this, because Obama wanted to get involved with his 7 billion Power Africa initiative that never really got off the ground. So offering loans for infrastructure isn't inherently bad by any means. Another reason that China might be more willing to take risks when loaning to developing countries is that if enough countries need renminbi to pay off their loans, then renminbi might become the reserve currency of Africa. 
This is another topic entirely, but the point is that if renminbi becomes a reserve currency, China can print more money than it would otherwise be able to do. This would also explain China's endless swap deals, and could be another reason for the dealings, as opposed to the loan shark claims. The third point is that the case studies we gave earlier don't quite add up. Sri Lanka only owed 10% of their external debts to China, and the money from Hambanto to port wasn't even spent paying off Chinese debts. It was spent paying off Sri Lanka's US sovereign bonds, which were at higher interest rates. Hambamto to port also made a loss of $300 million since it was built, and when the new administration came into power in 2015, they conceded that it was a waste of money. So it makes sense that they might have been willing to get rid of it. In fact, the Sri Lankan ambassador to China said that the port was actually offered to China by Sri Lanka. With Djibouti, while they do have a lot of Chinese debt, China has actually forgiven some of their debt, as we mentioned earlier. Furthermore, the fact that China has a military base there doesn't really prove anything, because, well, everyone has a military base there. On the Tajikistan border dispute, you could argue that Tajikistan's debt wasn't really the deciding factor here, and that even if they didn't have any debt, you'd still expect China to win in a territory dispute. The one thing those defending China have to admit, though, is that the country isn't transparent about its lending. There's no two ways about this, especially when you compare it to other lenders of their size. The IMF, the World Bank, and almost all developed countries keep meticulous lending records. This makes the financial system run smoothly, because everyone needs to know who owes money to who when evaluating risk. Anyway, those are the main arguments on either side, that China is or isn't a loan shark. Having heard the case, do you think that China's extraordinary lending is debt trap diplomacy? Or is it just that the developing countries want infrastructure, and China wants its renminbi to become a reserve currency? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.